Hi there. Um, we're going to start. Um, hopefully, a few more people will come wandering in. Um, so I'm Kelly Gleason from Delta 8.7. Uh, I'll be your moderator today. Um, so we are going to have a very, very interactive experience. Um, today, I'd like to welcome uh, colleagues from Lumos Foundation. Um, this is Chloe Setter. This is Chris Cuthbert. Oh, there's your name, yeah. Blackert. <laughs> nice. Yeah, right. OK, so we really are going to do things um, a little differently than the panel Q&A style today. Um, we're really going to try and workshop out some uh, answers. Um, I hope most people were able to see the presentation uh, that, that Chris did this morning um, to give you a little tiny overview um, on orphan trafficking, um, though there will be an introduction um, by both uh, panelists. Um, but then for the rest of the session, instead of the normal Q&A, we'd like to break into two working groups and really workshop out um, some solutions, um, some thoughts, some concepts. Um, so um, we will uh, get started with the introduction now, uh, and then we will let you know how to split up in the room, and so we can work this out. Okay. It means you have to really concentrate. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> Great. Can you hear that okay? Great. Fantastic. Well, as Kelly said, this session really is, um, we're in sponge mode. Uh, we want to pick your brains, your ideas. We've been incredibly inspired already today by all sorts of different ideas of how technology can be used to help solve um, some of the most pressing challenges. Um, so I'm going to do the first part of a two-part um, framing of the issue around orphanage trafficking. Um, and then Chloe will pick up um, uh, to, 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 to really start to get into some of the definitional issues. Um, so, so my bit of the presentation is going to focus a little bit on what do we know around institutional care and the harms to children um, and the state of the evidence base more broadly. So I wanted to start by showing you this uh, paper from the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, it asks the question, are institutions for infants necessary? Um, a very esteemed journal, um, and, and I, I invite you to note the year that this was published, 1915. So scientists have been asking these questions, uh, physiologists, psychi psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, practitioners from many, many disciplines have been trying to understand and chart the impacts of institutionalization on children's well-being. Um, and, and this is a, an endeavor that continues. So 100 years later, uh, The Lancet published um, a really important review on the evidence around the harms of institutionalization to children's development. Um, and this body of largely observational research from multiple different disciplines really helps to chart um, the whole range of different impacts across different domains of children's well-being that are associated um, with being in institutional care. And that spans children's physical, neurological development, their cognitive development, their ability to learn, their memory, their attention, the skills that they need to be able to enter uh, the labor market and to have successful um, relationships, their social and emotional development. Um, we have many really good high quality studies such as the English and Romanian adoption studies, the Bucharest early intervention studies with high quality perspective and randomized designs that give us confidence um, in our knowledge about some of the different harms associated with being in institutions. Um, and those studies now, um, particularly of Romanian orphans, <coughs> have been following children's development for around 20 years. So we're now getting data um, on their experiences into adulthood and indeed the experiences of the next generation. So we know an enormous amount about some of the harms of institutionalization. Uh, and this has led to a major global policy agenda around securing the rights of children to family life. And UN guidelines um, on children's rights in relation to um, alternative care being a huge driver for reform um, in, in policy and practice around the world. Um, but there's an awful lot we still don't know. Um, a study 
by uh, UNICEF a couple of years ago, which collated data from available national statistics, estimated that there were around 2.7 million children around the world living in residential care. Um, and at the time of this report, what it said was this was the tip of the iceberg. Um, the data on, official data on children in institutional care is so poor um, that they suspect there are many, many more children. Previous estimates have suggested 8 million. Others say there may be many, many more millions of children. And we don't have an accurate picture at the moment of just how big this issue is. Um, and, and the fundamental problem is that our global data are only as good as the national data. Um, and so we have a whole range of challenges. So the absence of really good uh, data for places like China, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, places with large child populations um, really, really inhibits our ability to reliably estimate the scale um, of, of institutionalized care. Um, where data does exist, it's often very poor quality. There are inconsistent definitions between different countries or indeed different jurisdictions within countries. Um, often official data collections miss uh, specialist uh, centres like uh, baby homes or refugee camps. So there are many, many institutions that are off the radar. Decentralised systems in many countries mean we, we don't have data at a local level to be able to aggregate. Um, and, and of particular relevance, I think, to the, our conversations today, very often um, organisations, institutions are run outside of the purview of, of the state. So faith-funded institutions, um, for profit, private institutions as well, that are they're often off the radar. Um, and so we'd really like to understand much more about the, the overall scale um, and prevalence of, of those uh, institutions. Um, so we have many, many challenges in terms of data. We want your ideas and help about how we can move forward on that. There are a number of um, areas of promising and emerging practice, which I think are starting to address some of these data challenges. Um, and fundamentally, um, although I've said that many, many institutions um, are, are outside of the state, uh, state purview, state funding, the state is responsible and accountable for children's well-being, whether they're running the institutions or not. And so this is a really crucial principle under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. How do we ensure that these institutions are monitored, regulated, and that children's well-being is, is protected? This is a state duty, but when we don't know how many institutions or how many children, it's often really challenging to, to put into practice. Um, so data collection in some places like Scotland and England um, shows that it is possible to get good data on a quarterly basis about not only the populations in care, but in the at-risk populations, children vulnerable and in need. Um, in Europe, the Transmoney project um, has helped to catalogue and provide some estimates uh, where, there, where there are systems that have some official data. Um, and more innovatively, uh, sample-based surveys, work done in Cambodia, have been able to expose the gap between official estimates um, and what sample surveys suggest to be the, the true prevalence. So we can start to see the gap between what's officially known and what's likely to be, to be happening there. UNICEF are doing work uh, on enumeration, trying to build the capacity of national statistical offices to undertake censuses of, of, of institutions right across uh, the country. They're doing that work in Ghana, um, and they hope to use that as a basis for promoting better data, data collection um, around the world. But that's a very long-run uh, game to be able to um, affect data collection uh, internationally in that kind of way. Um, and there's work to influence the, the DHS and the mix, those global household surveys. There are some questions already about families and uh, family members um, who aren't resident at, in the household. Um, and there's lots of work going on to influence those data collections that may be really interesting in being able to get some better prevalence estimates. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, this year, the uh, UN Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty, uh, led by Manfred Novak, um, 
we'll have a, an entire chapter looking at the issue of children uh, in institutions. Um, again, they've written to uh, states around the world asking for data on the prevalence. Um, the problem, of course, being that states can only provide the data that's already collected. So we, we, we imagine we'll still face some of the challenges when that data comes together. Um, We've been doing some work with the Center for Liberation Studies in Cape Town, a, an economist called Chris Desmond, um, mm -hmm. and a demographer at Harvard, just to do a bit of a stock take of what is and what isn't known about the prevalence of children in institutions. So that, that's involved systematically reviewing the, the published and gray literatures, a call across the sector to try and understand what um, unofficial surveys have been undertaken so that we can start to understand what is and what isn't known um, about prevalence of children in orphanages. Um, and as part of that work, we've also been looking at major um, household surveys um, and we've been able to identify that there are, in a number of countries, questions are asked about um, group living. And so we're hopeful that we may be able to do some estimations on the basis um, of uh, that work. Um, so I guess in terms of the overall picture around institutional care, there are many, many gaps in what we know at the moment, and we would really like some creative ideas, creative solutions to help us think um, about how we can not only understand the scale of this issue, but be able to track progress in this very fast-paced uh, reform process uh, that's starting to, to take place. And so we're very inspired by the Global Slavery Index, um, and we're kind of interested in uh, a thought experiment around whether there could be something analogous in the, in, the, in the care sector, some kind of global care reform index. So I will plant that seed, um, and, and we'll pick that up in the discussions. I'm going to hand over now to Chloe, who's then going to pick up and uh, really talk about the dimension, the intersection between the broad issue of institutional care and the specific in, uh, issue of trafficking. Seems to be working, yeah. I'll use this one. Right, hello everybody. Uh, great to be here. Uh, my name is Chloe. Um, um, my, I have a very unique role. I think it must be one of the most niche roles in the world. Uh, looking, <laughs> looking, I've narrowed down. I'm never going to get another job. Um, <laughs> narrowed down into looking specifically at human trafficking and the intersection, as Chris says, with, with modern slavery and trafficking. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be looking at this because it really feels like a frontier issue, a cusp issue, something that's not really been explored fully before um, and one in which there's lots of opportunity for us to make grounds. Um, so I was going to look at and explain what are the main ways that institutional care and trafficking interact. So there are four main ways that we've identified. The first one being that children are trafficked into institutions. And I'll talk a little bit specifically about orphanage trafficking, which is one of the forms. But children can be trafficked into institutions for other reasons too, um, for uh, forced begging, for sexual exploitation, for forced labour. They can be trafficked out of institutions, uh, and that can be, again, for multiple types of exploitation, including illegal adoption. Um, and they can be children who have been trafficked already, or unaccompanied children who are at risk of trafficking, are often placed in institutions as a response to their trafficking experience. And often that's deemed under the sort of guise of for their own protection. Um, and often done with well-meaning intentions. And also care leavers. So Chris mentioned some of the harms that, and the studies that have been done about children living in institutions and the, and the outcomes for them in life. Uh, and care leavers, so children who have grown up in institutions, are more vulnerable to exploitation after they've like, aged out of the institutional care system. So what we see here is it's a complex interplay. So institutions are both a source of... Um, a source of where trafficking can happen, a recruitment ground for trafficking, but also a destination for trafficking. But today I'll be talking to you specifically about the issue of orphanage trafficking. Uh, and that's a working definition up there. That's um, from a, an academic and lawyer based in Australia called Kate Van Door. Um, and she defines orphanage trafficking as the active recruitment of children from vulnerable families into residential institutions for the purpose of exploitation. And so quite simply, that is the, the placement of children in an orphanage in order to make money 
for the people running the orphanage. Um, so what we're looking at is almost like a new form of exploitation in some ways, or a form of financial exploitation, if you will. So there, there may well be other types of exploitation that happen too, like sexual exploitation or the children being forced to perform or to beg um, or to do work. But those things don't need to be present. What we're saying and what this academic and many others are saying is that just the placement and the recruitment of that child and placement into an institution for the, for the reason to make money is exploitation, which I like to think most of you won't disagree with. <laughs> and if you think about it in the, in the US or the UK care context, um, if you think about that, that would, if that happened here, children were actively being taken from families and put into the care system to make money, it, there'd be a, a national outcry. But unfortunately, this is happening and, and we want to make there be an international outcry about this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the orphanage business. So in recent years, there's been uh, a trend of citizens of mostly wealthier nations volunteering in, visiting, and donating to institutions overseas, mostly in the global south. Uh, many of these institutions we found, unfortunately, are being set up in order to uh, operate as a business for these volunteers um, and for people wanting to donate to institutions. And so it is effectively being run like a business, um, which is, as you can imagine, uh, not what we want to be happening. And some examples of this uh, from Haiti. So that we, Chris mentioned we don't have particularly good data in this area. We know it's happening from anecdotal evidence, uh, from case reports from specific countries. And one of the things we want to talk about today is how do we get better data? So in Haiti, where Lumos has an office, um, we did some work. Then we didn't know when we registered that office. We were just looking at closing institutions, as we do as part of our model, working with governments to help close institutions and set up alternative family-based care systems. But what we found in Haiti was just a huge predominance of trafficking and huge inflows of money um, that were driving the, the, the setting up of these orphanages. Um, and what we found, uh, which is common I across, the, across the world, is that around 80% of children living in orphanages are not orphans, which is always a surprise to many people. <laughs> um, most 80% on average have at least one living parent. And the reason that children are in those orphanages are varied and, and, and vary from region to region, country to country, um, but are usually things like poverty, disability, uh, want children wanting, uh, fa sorry, families wanting their children to uh, get access to education or health care. Um, it's, it's rare in our experience as an organisation that families just want to give up their children um, for bad intentions. And in Haiti, there were around 30, 32,000 children living in institutions, but 85% of those orphanages were not regulated. They were not being accounted for, no scrutiny, no checks. And those children are clearly at risk. And what we wanted to do is we were having reports of the orphanages using child finders, they called them, which to me sounds like a quite Dickensian um, kind of method of recruiting children. So people going out who are paid to go out and actively recruit children from their families um, under the pretense that these children would have a better life, that they'd have education and, and f three meals a day. Um, whereas in reality, that was not what was happening and the children were being very poorly cared for. Um, and we also saw evidence of what's called paper orphaning, where a child's documents are faked to make them look like an orphan um, on paper, even when they have living parents. And again, that is to help give off the impression to the outside world that these are all poor orphans that need your money, need your help, um, and is often used in it as a fundraising tool. Um, and we also tracked the money, which was an interesting thing um, to see. Uh, so we've traced at least, and I say at least because obviously we couldn't trace all of it, 100 million US dollars a year going into these institutions. And to put that into some context, um, it's about 100 times the Haitian Child a Protection Agency's annual budget. <laughs> um, it's the equivalent of one third of all US foreign aid to Haiti. Um, it's two and a half times the funds needed to provide education to all children who are currently out of school in Haiti. And it could fund the reunification of all of the children in orphanages in Haiti. Uh, so you, you can see, when you look at the, what's happening in practice, is these really badly run orphanages full of children, mostly being neglected, uh, in many cases being abused. We came across cases of, of, of children disappearing and, and reports of, of deaths and murders in some of these places. 
Um, but yet, the money that's coming in is being generated by people who think that they're trying to do good, and they, they believe in their hearts that they're doing a good thing. Which, unlike many other areas of trafficking, is, is often not, not the case. It, a lot of the, the, the facilitation of trafficking in this context is sadly being helped by people who think they're doing good. And there's other evidence that shows um, or indicative of uh, large-scale exploitation and commodification. And one of the, the areas of work where Lumos has done over the last sort of 12 years mostly has been focused in Europe. But outside of Europe, uh, we've seen an increase in the number of orphanages, but a decrease in the number of orphans. And there's actually been this huge, huge increase in the number of orphanages. Um, and this helps to suggest that there's actually a business operating. So in, hold on, where? In Uganda, the number of in children in institutions increased from just over 1,000 in the late 90s to 55,000 now, despite there being a decrease in the number of actual orphans. And there's evidence to show that these orphanages are being built in tourist hotspots. Um, and 85% of the children in these, in these institutions also had traceable family members. In Malawi, um, there was also evidence found in more than half of the facilities were involved in actively recruiting children. In Cambodia, um, there was also evidence that overseas donors were the main funders of residential care um, and that they were having to solicit for funding, in doing so putting children at risk. Because in order for a business like this to be successful, they need children, <laughs> they need orphans, um, and then they use those orphans or children to advertise for funding, particularly from funding overseas. Um, and in Nepal, shockingly, 90% of the orphanages are located in tourist hotspots. Um, and that highlights the issue that we talk about as voluntourism or orphanage tourism. Um, it's a huge issue in Nepal and in other countries, Cambodia, Guatemala, Tanzania, Kenya, many, many countries, um, where tourism is a huge part of the, the country's income. Um, and what has been noticed is that tourists like to come and have a nice time and they also want to try and do good, particularly in countries that are poorer. Um, and one of the things that gets advertised both before they leave, sometimes in universities or through churches or education establishments, but also when they get there uh, at local tourism uh, offices um, and at train stations and so on, is the opportunity to volunteer or to visit an orphanage and do some good and give something back. And again, it's mostly good intentioned people trying to give their time and usually end up giving their money as well um, and often go home and end up fundraising and sending money back. Um, and sadly, they don't often realize that there's a double deception going on. So the, the children's families are being exploited um, and being deceived into what they think will happen to their children. Uh, and the wealthier foreigners are often being manipulated for their money. Um, and voluntourism, as it's known, is a, a rapidly expanding industry. And obviously, it creates a system that is open to exploitation. Um, and for those of you who might be thinking that voluntourism itself doesn't always equate to trafficking and that not every orphanage has trafficking in it, that, that's correct, but that voluntourism itself has been shown and known to do harm. Um, it creates psychological attachment disorders in children. If you think about the fact the numbers of uh, volunteers coming into an orphanage and, and dealing with a child, sometimes that can number in the hundreds. And every time the child develops a, a bond with that individual, two weeks later they leave. And that happens again and again and again. And these are children who don't have primary caregivers in their lives. It creates them to either shut down emotionally and not form attachments, or to fo or to uh, the opposite situation where the child f too easily forms attachments. And these can have huge impacts on a child's relationship development la in later life. It also, we know that volunteers are usually unskilled that do this. And we, I, I heard uh, uh, the Australian um, Senator Reynolds, who worked with us uh, on developing legislation in Australia on the Modern Slavery Act um, around this area. And she said, you wouldn't allow, in, in our country, wouldn't allow busloads of tourists unfettered access to our most vulnerable children. But yet, why do we think this is OK in other countries? Um, and this, it also puts to the fact and that lots of evidence to show that it's a, a magnet for uh, sex offenders um, who know that they can subvert weaker child protection systems and gain access to vulnerable children. There's also issues around 
colonial <laughs> approaches, white savior mentalities, um, and the fact that it's by f by incentivizing and, and investing uh, people their time and money in orphanages is a disincentive for investing in family-based services and prevention services. So things are changing. Um, this is a campaign from quite a few years ago now by, by Friends International, um, but it, it quite adequately sums up this concept that children are not tourist attractions, and it was quite a hard-hitting campaign. Um, and we've also got powerful voices joining in the debate, like Lumos's founder, J.K. Rowling, uh, who a couple of years ago in 2016 um, started tweeting about this. It's an issue that's very close to her heart. Um, and it has impact. These, these things do have impact. And the fact that we're already seeing um, change happening, we're already seeing volunteer sending agencies stopping sending packages to orphanages, um, but there's still lots that still do. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do to co convince them and to convince the volunteers who want to go and do it that this is a harmful behavior. Uh, and globally, there's been some progress. I'll, I'll whiz through this quickly. Um, but the TIP report, the Trafficking in Persons report uh, last year, did a special section on children in institutions and the, and the links around orphanage trafficking, um, which was very welcomed. Uh, the Australia Modern Slavery Act also referenced the, the risk of children being trafficked into and out of institutions in its legislation. Um, and has set up a dedicated website about vol safe volunteering um, and is trying to tackle some of the issues around orphanage tourism. Um, the Netherlands is looking to do the same, potentially. Um, the UK Modern Slavery Act is under review at the moment, uh, and there's also uh, and the terms of reference for that included looking at orphanage trafficking, which is a huge step from something that hadn't been talked about at all to being in the terms of reference for an important uh, legislative review. Um, the Trust Conference, we spoke there this year, there was a panel dedicated to orphanage trafficking, which again I think was the first time that that's happened in the trafficking sector. Um, many of you will come from the anti-trafficking sector, um, and I myself worked in it before starting at Lumos six months ago, and this, was, this is and hasn't been on the agenda particularly, um, but we want to make sure that it is. Um, and we've seen, like I said, businesses changing their business models, such as those who've relied on making money out of volunteers wanting to go abroad to trying to look into alternatives. Um, so we've been trying to track the problem uh, and look at how we can get better data. And Chris has talked about the more broad issues of data of children in institutions. And I'm going to, this is specifically about the data on orphanage trafficking. Some of the ways we've tried to do this, and I, as I said, it's a, these are quite early stage uh, interventions and approaches is because uh, we're in a slight chicken and egg situation where um, we need more evidence to evidence that this is happening um, and to drive resources into this area and to have advocacy approaches uh, and convince governments it's happening because we quite often get told it's not happening um, but at the same time without the evidence to do that um, so we, it's a chicken and egg situation and there's no apart from that working definition it's not defined in law specifically anywhere the concept of orphanage trafficking so it, it really is a hidden population as, as the name of this workshop <laughs> suggests um, so we're doing some work um, through the Thomson Reuters Foundation's Trust Law Project, which is looking at case law around exploitation in institutions from about 20 legal jurisdictions. Again, there is no cases of orphanage trafficking because it's not a crime per se, but looking at similar related crimes and how they might have been recorded. Um, there's been some research by Rethink Orphanages, a coalition group which we're a member of, which is looking at mapping the European support for institutions overseas by looking at funding, um, volunteer sending, sending agencies, universities that advertise orphanage volunteering. And they've done that mostly through literature reviews, looking at online adverts, um, and a sort of internet analysis of tourism websites. Um, and we're also looking to do a faith survey this year. With we're working with Catholic Relief Services, an uh, internal uh, survey of of their members about how they give and how yeah whether they donate, whether they volunteer, um, which will give us better data. But as you can see, we've got a, a small <laughs> data set to start with, um, which is going to make this tricky. And that's why we would like to talk to you today um, for the hot house. So we know about the harm of children living in institutions. We know about the evidence. Uh, we know about the issue of, of orphanage trafficking. Um, but like I said, this is mostly anecdotal, country level. Uh, how do we translate this into better data, into something that people can recognize, um, people can propose solutions to, um, and people can map? And we need this evidence to drive forward 
advocacy. We need it to tr help transition funds away from funding institutional care to alternative family-based solutions, help businesses move away, help volunteers shift their attitudes. Um, so we need you to help, and that's where this bit gets a bit more interactive and you don't have to listen to us talking anymore. Um, so there are two groups. I'll just read out what the groups are, and then it's up to you, really, to choose which group you think you have more interest in or can add more value to. Um, the first one is kind of more around definitions and, and well, like operationalizing. I, I, I hate that word, um, but I've put it in the presentation. <laughs> um, I'll try and explain what I mean. So basically, it's orphanage trafficking. How can it be defined, identified, and measured? And what we're asking here is to help you to help us identify what are some of the challenges, but also the creative solutions to operationalizing, like making this, if this, if this were to be a crime, how would it be defined? How would we identify it on the ground in practice? How would we measure orphanage trafficking? Um, and the risk factors around it, what are the risk factors that might put a child m more at risk of being trafficked into an orphanage? Um, so that's the first group, and we can. One of us will be on the group, um, so we, we won't just leave you. To, to you can join in, and we can come up with other ideas and pointers and get conversations going. Uh, and then the second group, um, which is a very long title, uh, finding the hotspots, uh, mapping ma mapping the institutions, volunteers, visitors, and money. And this is this is more data focused, I suppose, um, in terms of how can we understand hotspots where there are concentrations of institutions, volunteers, and funding flows that are likely to be indicative of trafficking? Um, and what are the solutions for gathering reliable data about these to evidence scale and, and, and sources of money? Uh, does that sound like something you think you could get your teeth back into? <laughs> if not, we'll be there. I, I didn't hear a roar of enthusiasm. <laughs> But yes, yes, that's good. Um, but we, like I said, Chris and I and our colleague Deborah, uh, who's also from Numos, um, are going to be in the room, and Kelly too, um, to to get these conversations going. But we really we understand this is we're at the really explorative early stages. So there's no such thing as a bad idea. We want to hear your thoughts, your approaches. I've got some copies of the questions as well. Um, so please do. I can hand these out if you want me to pass them round or but how would I guess the best way is for people to put their hands up to see which group so if if you'd like uh, we can have group one come up here um, and so basically we're going to be going off the grid in sort of two ways um, so we're going to kind of go off mic while we just brainstorm because we're going to be having two conversations at the same time also the chair grid is going to have to change. So um, for group one, we're going to kind of like cluster up here. Um, group two, we're going to use the back seats and kind of cluster around. And so we're just going to have sort of like an organic conversation. Um, so again, group one is measurement, operationalizing, um, talking about concepts. Um, and group two, talking about data solutions, what might be available out there already, um, tools, tricks of the trade, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, if you, w whichever and group you choose is fine. Um, we might drag people from one group to another if it's too heavy <laughs> or too light. Not um, physically. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> Chain gang everyone. Okay, into a group. so are we ready? Yeah, and also um, at the end of it, we will do a little feeding back from the groups to, the main, to this group um, so you can hear what the discussions were in the other group. And I imagine that will probably be one of us that does that, or, or, a, or a lovely volunteer. Will, will help us. Okay, yeah, yeah cool. Great.
So can I, does this one work? Yeah. Can I have the repertoires come up and uh, do some reporting back to the group? <laughs> Sounds like some conversation still going because it seemed very productive. It's very good. Oh, and also, but before we get into the reporting back, uh, I just want to let you know that there's a sign-up sheet up here so that everyone can keep in contact with Lumos Foundation, of course. Um, but it seemed like the, the conversation's still going organically anyway. So um, just to let you know, we're not trying to shortchange you by, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Um, but I'll hand it over now to our repertoires. Uh, okay, so um, I've, I've got a whole load of notes here, none of which are particularly well organised. <laughs> so, um, um, so I'll try to um, I'll try to draw out some of the some of the key thoughts. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a bit of a bit of a data dump. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking about the, uh, the about the working definition that, that you can see up there, um, and which parts of that are really necessary. Um, so is it is it necessary that the that the families are, are kind of vulnerable? Um, you know, what kind of exploitation are we are we necessarily talking about? Um, so it was uh, we definitely spent a, a good amount of time thinking about the the different ways in which it could be defined. Um, and then in terms of some of the key challenges of, of so this is about measuring orphan trafficking. Uh, there's quite a few there's quite a few data gaps. So often we're just not we're just not looking in the right places. There's of often no records exist. Um, there's not enough resources to go and ask all, all organizations. Um, you know, there's all sorts of ways we could do kind of random sampling, um, but also how can we enable uh, self-reporting of, of organizations? How can we get people in inside them to kind of um, anonymously um, say what, what, what might be going on. Uh, some of the other potential uh, created solutions. Um, so we agreed that the first thing we should do is define a set of indicators and features that are indicative of, of trafficking, uh, and then try to validate them with, with both good and bad institutions. Uh, there are various other things that we can potentially learn from. Um, so can we, can we learn from the uh, you know, various kind of demand reduction initiatives and, and sex trafficking? Um, wh what can we learn from the kind of 15% of orphanages that are, that are doing it really well. Uh, what can we learn from kind of good organization ratings at, you know, for other charities like kind of Hurricane Relief and so on? Um, although we, we thought it, we, we were kind of reluctant to try to build an algorithm that kind of you know, rates orphanages. There's, a, there's all sorts of, of dangers in that. Um, can we learn from things like the Kids for Cash scandal in, in Pennsylvania? Like how, how was that eventually kind of detected and, and stopped? Um, Yeah, so we need to um, we need to kind of switch the narrative, um, you know, to, to a more effective way of kind of dissuading people. So we thought it was it, you know it's better to actually you know detect kind of actual crimes that have been committed as a way of kind of stopping people from from donating to potentially bad orphanages. Um, and we need to sort of change the mentality of you know that people have of, of kind of a, a requirement to do some good overseas, like to get to get into Harvard or whatever. Um, it's uh, you know yeah. <laughs> You know, people should be a lot, a lot more aware of, of you know the kind of industry that that, that, that they're creating. Uh, so I think that's most of what I've what I've, what I've got written down. But I'll, I'll try to uh, organise it a bit more for, for the morning. Great, thank you so much. Okay. All right. So our group uh, sort of the official uh, assignment was to think about uh, you know possible ways of using data. Um, I think we went slightly beyond that scope and also ended up discussing. Um, strategies for bringing about uh, change, sort of changing changing the system. So I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. 
Um, generally, there was you know broad agreement about the value of, of da bringing data to this. Um, among other things, um, you know, uh, currently there's an experience of you know to some extent it being possible to identify hotspots, um, but it's being it being very laborious and, and also taking a lot of time to to prove cases and prove prove where problems lie and to convince donors you know from diverting funding to divert funding and so on. So data. Um, Analytics uh, offers the, the the potential to to make these these processes more more efficient and to stop things sooner um, than is currently the case. And um, so, in thinking about different data sources, I think there were sort of two areas of focus. On the one hand, um, one theme was that uh, there might be value in focusing on the sort of the, the path of volunteers and the data trail um, that they may leave. Um, so on the one hand, there was the, the idea, for example, of introducing some sort of an, an, an equivalent to a customs declaration for, for volunteerists where either on exiting or entering the country, they declare sort of what kind of activities they've been involved in or you know, where they've donated uh, money. Um, there was the idea of uh, uh, setting up a system sort of similar to Yelp uh, for orphanages where, where institutions are rated um, to, to increase uh, transparency. Uh, one concern there was, of course, that those kind of system systems can also be gamed in the same way in which, uh, you know, restaurants put up fake reviews on, on Yelp <laughs> to um, uh, increase their attractiveness. Um, sort of generally the idea that there it might be easier to get data in the in wealthy countries or the, the countries of origin of foreign tourists, um, including on social media. You know, there's quite a lot of, uh, there's no lack of, of people sort of perhaps even posting or at least reporting publicly what kind of activities they're engaged in um, in terms of volunteerism, so trying to leverage that. Um, and uh, yeah, also sort of follow the, the sort of the advertising um, and PR streams of you know, organizations that are active in that field, um, say at universities or at high schools, wh what kind of orphanages or institutions uh, do they point to and try to get a better understanding of, of those institutions. So that's the, the one focus, uh, looking at volunteers. The other focus area was, you know, to the value of looking at information on the ground, um, the value of local knowledge that might not be available to, to outsiders and also not be um, visible to, to tourists. Um, there was the idea of relying on satellite-based uh, analysis, um, for example, to see where, you know, orphanages might be shut down and new ones might be established, although of course there are limitations to what, what satellite imagery uh, can do here. Um, there was an idea of using facial recognition potentially, um, although that of course raises all kinds of ethical concerns, but the, the idea of using sort of um, sentiment analysis, you know, in say on uh, children's faces um, in, in analyzing the quality of institutions. So that's uh, all that I think sort of we discussed in terms of data sources. And then I'll briefly say a few things on the wider discussion about both challenges in, in collecting data and bringing about change and then also strategies for, for change. So in terms of challenges, um, one topic was the, you know, the difficulty of convincing host countries um, to care about the issue and to be accountable, especially given the reputational risks uh, at stake in making these issues uh, public. Also sort of, you know, monetary reasons, a loss of uh, tourists or volunteers' uh, uh, um, income. Um, given that it's difficult in certain contexts to convince country governments, it might be, it might be easier to sort of enlist the help of uh, locals in collecting data, um, local volunteers crowdsourcing data although that then raises security concerns, um, depending on context. Um, more generally, in terms of bringing about change, you know, the difficulty of changing cultural norms in cases where families might not be, sort of the, the risks might not be salient to families, um, or where they are salient or visible, families might still think um, their children are better off um, going down the path they go down compared to staying with their families. Um, the question of what to do if, you know, if problematic institutions are found, what to do with them, sort of, if, uh, if, the, if they're closed down, are children 
actually better off or, or what needs to happen to ensure that, uh, that they will be better off. Um, and the issue of unintended consequences um, or sort of the, the risk of in attempting to prevent uh, bad things from happening also crowding out actually you know, positive progress, um, especially in emergency cases. Um, yeah. I don't know, do, am I taking too much time? Sure. You can write it down. Okay, so just, if you want to summarize it. Yeah, just, well, just, yeah, just very quickly, in terms of positive, on a positive note, strategies for change. Um, the possibility of awareness campaigns at airports, high schools, universities, to, to point out, for example, the fact that 80% of children in orphanages aren't actually orphans. And the idea of standard setting came up uh, several times. Um, you know, some form of certification, perhaps, for, for orphanages. It could be uh, some kind of LUMOS uh, back certification scheme, potentially. Although I guess there's a tension with your overall mission of actually yeah. <laughs> uh, abolishing <laughs> uh, orphanages altogether. Um, uh, legal uh, legislative, ch legislative changes um, and poli policy changes to, to uh, ensure that, that progress is monitored. Um, the leverage of funders in introducing conditionality um, and compliance with certain standards. Um, and uh, the idea that it's important to look at sort of the supply chain and the, um, the variety of incentives at play that, that underpin and maintain you know, these, these systems. Um, and yeah, to think about the problem holistically. Yeah. Great, thank you. <coughs> All right, um, so it's, it's kind of difficult to wrap up a session that feels like it just got some real momentum. Um, I think this was a fantastic session. Uh, so thank you to Lumos for bringing this frontier issue um, to all of us um, for discussion. Thank you to our colleagues at the Turing Institute um, for reporting back and holding a lively discussion with us. And then especially thanks to everyone who really came together um, and had this really interactive session, um, especially at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of a long day. So um, there's a sign-up sheet being passed around. Um, if anybody hasn't signed up yet, I'm sure uh, keeping in contact would be great for everyone. So thank you again for coming. Thank you.